Bienvenue. Thank you everyone for coming to the 30th event of Disrupting Disruptions, the Feminist and Accessible Publishing Communications Technologies um, and Practices Speaker and Workshop Series. This is our first event of 2021. Thank you everyone with your patience um, and our needing to reschedule some of our early 20, earlier 2021 events. I'm Dr. Alex Ketchum and I'm a professor of feminist and social justice studies at McGill and the organizer of the series. The Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications, and Technologies Practices Speaker and Workshop Series seeks to bring together scholars, creators, and people in industry working at the intersections of digital humanities, computer science, feminist studies, disability studies, communication studies, LGBTQ studies, history, and critical race theory. Season two will build on themes of earlier seasons, but we'll also ask questions about sustainability, maintenance, right to repair, and the power of speculative futures. Past series speakers, Suzanne Kite and Jess McLean, have pointed to the physical and material impacts of the digital world. While the events this semester are virtual, everything that we do is tied to the land and the space that we are on. Furthermore, as the series seeks to draw attention to power relations that have been invisibilized, it's important to acknowledge Canada's long colonial history and current political practices. The series is affiliated with the Institute for Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies at McGill University. We are currently located in Jojoge, Montreal, on unceded Ganyangahaga territory. Furthermore, the ongoing organizing efforts by the Wessalodan people at the Unistodan camp make clear the ever-present and ongoing colonial violence in Canada. Interwoven with this history of colonization is one of enslavement and racism. This university's namesake, James McGill, enslaved Black and Indigenous peoples. It was in part from the money he acquired through these violent acts that McGill University was founded. These histories are here with us in this space and inform the conversations that we have today. The series was made possible thanks to our many funders, a special thanks to the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the IGSF, MILU, the Indigenous Futures Lab, the Intersectionality Research Hub, MILA, the Black Feminist Futures Working Group, Cinema Politica, and more. Please check out our website and social media for a list of our sponsors and also a list of our upcoming talks. We have 12 this semester. And they're mostly all on Wednesdays. On January 27th is our rescheduled event with Deb Raji. She'll be talking about the limitations of auditing algorithms. February 3rd is Eleanor Carmi on media distortions. February 10th is Yeshi Milner on abolishing big data and data for black lives. And we have many more. So please check out our website. We have videos of past events and information of future events there and also on our social media. All of our events are free to attend, open to the public, and while virtual, professionally captioned. Thank you today to our captionist, Nicole. For this event, recording is enabled, so the event can be posted on YouTube later and embedded on our website. Don't worry though, only the speakers will be shown in the video. We also have a Q&A option available. So throughout the talk, you may type your questions into the question and answer box, and there'll be some time at the end for this Q&A period. Um, we will only read the first name, um, uh, that you post, or if you don't want us to say your name at all, you can write that in the question. So now for today's event, I now have the pleasure of introducing Dr. S Sasha Costanza Chuck. They are a researcher and designer who works to support community-led processes that build shared power, move towards collective liberation, and advance ecological survival. They're known for their work on network social movements, transformative media organizing, and design justice. Sasha is a research scientist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, with a joint appointment in Media, Arts, and Sciences at the MIT Media Lab and the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. They're a senior research fellow at the Algorithmic Justice League and a faculty affiliate with the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. Sasha is a board member of the Allied Media Projects and a member of the steering committee of the Design Justice Network. Sasha is author of two books and numerous journal articles, book chapters, and other research publications. Their new book, Design Justice, Community-Led Practices to Build the Worlds We Need, was published by MIT Press in 2020. And this is such a good book. I highly recommend it. If you're my student, you've probably already read sections of it in our classes, but definitely check out this book after the talk if you haven't. And what I love is there's an open access version. So thank you for doing that, Sasha. So thank you everyone for participating, and I look forward to joining you in this talk. So take it away. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for that kind introduction and for having me here, Alex. I'm really excited um, to be here for this series and it's such a great series. Um, I'm just gonna take a moment to get uh, my screen share going. Okay, so you should now be seeing um, the presentation, maybe give me an indication that that's looking good for you. Yes, it looks good, thanks. Okay, awesome, thanks so much. Um, so thank you again for inviting me. And as you said, even though we're meeting virtually, um, I do wanna start with a land acknowledgement. Um, so I'm right now on the lands of the Wampanoag, Pawtucket and Massachusetts peoples. And we do have a responsibility to acknowledge the history and the ongoing violence of settler colonialism and to ask how we individually and institutionally can seek to end that violence and seek new paths forward. And we don't have a chat here. Um, often I like to ask people to kind of share their own acknowledgement in the chat. Um, but so I would ask people to just um, share your own land acknowledgement um, with yourself. Um, and take a moment to reflect on the lands that you're on. For a lot of us, at least here in what's called the US today, uh, today might feel like a moment when we can finally breathe again. It's good to acknowledge the defeat of an openly white supremacist misogynist administration, the fact that we narrowly avoided a coup and the hard work of community organizing largely led by black and brown women and femmes that delivered victories at the polls and flipped the US presidency and the Senate. So let's all take a deep breath together. Breathe in, breathe out. But if we zoom out to the longer view, it can help us prepare for the many generations of work that are gonna to need to take place to repair the deeply broken systems that surround us and shape our lives. And that doesn't change with any particular uh, administration. For example, although the lands of Turtle Island have been traversed by First Nations peoples for thousands of years, today they're fragmented by militarized borders. And not long ago, a couple months ago, documents gathered by Tech Inquiry revealed a Google Cloud contract to work with Andoril Industries surveillance tech on the so-called virtual border wall at the US-Mexico border. This is a partnership to develop cutting edge, sensing classification, AI decision support systems, and augmented reality user interface design in partnership with Customs and Border Patrol, the agency responsible for forced separation of thousands of children from their parents for extended periods of time and several hundred permanent separations, deaths in custody, non-consensual invasive gyne gynecological procedures, forced sterilization, and myriad human rights abuses. We do have a chance here with this new administration to dismantle some of that, but we're gonna have to work hard for it, just as we will for everything. The good news is in this talk, I'm gonna be focusing on a sea change that I believe is taking place. There is a growing sense that the often unintended harms of computing systems require us to slow down, to reevaluate, to consider societal and long-term impacts, and sometimes to refuse to participate in certain kinds of work. So today I'm hoping to share some ideas from my new book, Design Justice, that I believe might be useful to that long-term project, that multi-generational project of making design systems of various kinds, including computing systems, less harmful, and of developing our shared capacity to help build the worlds we need. I'll begin in June of 2017. I'm standing in the security line at the Detroit Metro Airport on my way back to Boston from the Allied Media Conference, which is a quote, collaborative laboratory of media-based organizing that's been held every year in Detroit for the past two decades. At the AMC, over 3,000 people uh, gather each year to share ideas and strategies for how to create a more just, creative, and collaborative world. As a non-binary, trans, femme-presenting person, 
my time there has always been very deeply liberating. It's a conference that strives harder than any space I know of to be deeply inclusive of all kinds of people, including queer, trans, intersex, and gender nonconforming folks. It's not perfect, and every year brings new challenges and difficult conversations about what it means to construct truly inclusive spaces, and I always learn a lot there. It's always a powerful experience. So emerging from a week immersed in that parallel world, I'm tired, but on a deep level, I'm refreshed. My reservoir of belief in the possibility of creating better futures has been replenished. Yet, as I stand in the security line and draw closer to the millimeter wave scanning machine, my stress levels begin to rise. My heartbeat begins to speed up slightly as I near the end of the line, because I know I'm about to be subject to an embarrassing, uncomfortable, and perhaps humiliating search by a TSA officer after my body gets flagged as anomalous by the millimeter wave scanner. And I know that's about to happen because of the particular socio-technical configuration of gender normativity, cis normativity, which is the assumption that all people have a gender identity and presentation consistent with the sex they were assigned at birth. And that's been built into the scanner through a combination of user interface design, scanning technology, binary gendered body shape data constructs, and risk detection algorithms. And also it's in the socialization, training, and experience of the TSA agents. So a female presenting TSA agent motions me to step into the scanner. I step in, I raise my arms, and I place my hands in this triangle shape, my palms facing forward above my head. The scanner spins around my body and makes that noise. <laughs> And then the agent signals for me to step forward out of the machine and wait with my feet on the pad just past the scanner exit. And I look over to my left where a screen displays an abstracted outline of a human body. And this is what you're seeing uh, on the slide here. And as I expected, a bright fluorescent yellow block on the diagram highlights my groin area. Because when I entered the scanner, the TSA operator was prompted by the user interface to select male or female. They literally have a little blue button for boy and a little pink button for girl, right? And since my gender presentation is femme, usually the operator selects female, but the three-dimensional contours of my body at a millimeter resolution are different from the statistical norm of female bodies as understood by this data set and this risk algorithm and the manufacturer of the millimeter wave scanner and its subcontractors and it's been trained by an army of click workers tasked with labeling and classification, as scholars like Mary Gray and Lily Irani remind us. So if the agent selects male, my breasts are large enough, statistically speaking, in comparison to a normative male body shape, to trigger an anomaly warning and a highlight around my chest area. And if they select female, my groin area deviates enough from the statistical female norm to trigger a risk alert and bright yellow pixels highlight my groin. So in other words, I can't win. It's a socio-technical system that's hardwired to mark me as risky, and it's going to escalate me to the next level in the security protocol. And that's what happens. I get flagged. So then the agent asks me to step aside. They ask for my consent to a physical body search. And now they're confused about my gender, because now I'm closer to them. And so the problem is the next step is for a male or a female TSA agent to conduct a body search by running their hands across my arms and armpits, my chest, my hips and legs, my inner thighs. Because according to TSA policy, quote, if a pat down is performed, it will be conducted by an officer of the same gender as you present yourself, end quote. And as a non-binary trans femme, I'm a problem that's not easily resolved by the security protocol. So on this day, you know, uh, a nearby agent comes over and says, I'll do it. And I ask, aren't you gonna ask whether I prefer, you know, what gender I prefer? And this agent gets confused. Another one stops him, asks me what I'd prefer. But now I'm standing in public flanked by two TSA agents, one masculine presenting, one feminine presenting, and there's a line of curious travelers watching the whole thing. 
And ultimately they back off. One of them searches me um, and I'm cleared to continue on to my gate. The point of this story is to provide a small but concrete example from my own daily lived experience of how larger systems, including norms, values, and assumptions, are encoded in and reproduced through the design of socio-technical systems, or in political theorist Langdon Winner's famous words, how artifacts have politics. In this case, cis normativity is enforced at multiple levels of my interaction with airport security systems scanning technology, data sets, risk assessment, algorithms, operator practices are all designed on the assumption that there are only two genders and gender presentation conforms with so-called biological sex. Anybody whose body doesn't fall within an acceptable range of deviance from a normative binary body type is flagged as risky and subject to a heightened and disproportionate burden of the harms, whether small or potentially large, of airport security systems and the violence of empire they instantiate. Queer and trans people are disproportionately burdened by the design of millimeter wave scanning technology. The system is biased against us. To use Os Key's term, it's a misgendering machine. Most cisgender people are unaware of the way these devices work, and most trans people know because it directly affects our lives. Of course, these systems aren't only biased against trans people, but also against black folks who frequently experience invasive searches of their hair, as documented by ProPublica, against Sikh men, Muslim women, and others who wear head wraps, as described by sociologist Simone Brown in her brilliant book, Dark Matters. As Brown discusses, and as Joy Bulamwini, founder of the Algorithmic Justice League, technically demonstrates, gender itself is racialized, Humans have trained our machines to categorize faces and bodies as male and female through lenses tinted by the optics of white supremacy. Airport security is also systematically biased against many disabled people who are often flagged as risky if they have non-normative body shapes or if they use prostheses. The systems are biased against anyone who's simultaneously gender non-conforming, Black, Indigenous, Muslim, immigrant, or disabled. You might be doubly, triply, or multiply burdened by and face the highest risks of harms from this system. So my white skin, US citizenship, and institutional affiliation with MIT place me in a position of relative privilege, right? So I'm gonna be spared the most disruptive and harmful outcomes of security screening. For example, I don't have to worry this process will lead to my being placed in a detention center or in deportation proceedings. I won't be hooded and whisked away to Guantanamo Bay or one of the many other secret prisons that form part of the global infrastructure of the so-called war on terror. And that infrastructure continues across US administrations, of course. Most likely, I won't even miss my flight while I'm detained for what security expert Bruce Schneier describes as security theater. So others face much greater potential harms. And here I want to emphasize that the violent erasure of trans and gender nonconforming people isn't something new. It's not something that's dependent on this technology or any other technology. It's been happening for hundreds of years under the ongoing project of settler colonialism. Cis normativity was imposed upon indigenous peoples throughout the Americas and around the world through centuries of violence, both spectacular and everyday. First Nations, Cree, Two-Spirit scholar and activist Harlan Pruden, and Nishnabeg theorist and writer Leanne Simpson, among many others, are systematically recovering some of those histories. So by grounding an analysis of cisnormative border security systems in an analysis of settler colonial violence, I want to make it very clear I'm not an advocate of a, quote, technical solution to the problems with millimeter wave scanners. I'm not asking for them to be less biased or more transparent. Inclusion doesn't get at the underlying historical and structural problems that I want us to challenge. Instead, I'm asking us to think about how to build a world where millimeter wave scanners don't exist, where they, like other border technologies and carceral systems and the violence of empire have been abolished. So like Harsha Walia, I'm interested in undoing border imperialism. And I'm interested in dismantling what Ruha Benjamin calls the new Jim Code, 
discriminatory design that amplifies racial hierarchies through engineered inequity, default discrimination, coded exposure, and techno benevolence. Ruha calls out how technology design so often ignores and thereby replicates social divisions or aims to quote, fix racial bias, but ultimately reproduces it. So I'm interested in decarceral design, decolonizing design, design justice. Design justice is a framework for analysis about how the design of socio-technical systems influences the distribution of benefits and burdens between various groups of people. And design justice focuses explicitly on how design reproduces or challenges the matrix of domination. The matrix of domination is a term developed by black feminist scholar, sociologist, and past president of the American Sociological Association, Patricia Hill Collins, to refer to race, class, and gender as interlocking systems of oppression. It's a conceptual model that helps us think about how power and oppression, privilege and penalties, benefits, burdens, and harms are systematically distributed. And when she introduced the term in her book, Black Feminist Thought, Collins emphasized that race, class, and gender are three systems that historically have been most important in structuring most Black women's lives. But she notes that we could extend the term to include any and all systems of oppression that mutually constitute each other and that shape our lives. And so here I want to turn to, um, so far I've been, I've been sharing material that's mostly from the introduction to the book. Um, so if you uh, read the introduction, um, then that might have been familiar to you. Here I'm going to turn to a section about, um, called Everyday Things for Whom, which is about the distribution of affordances and disaffordances under the matrix of domination. So let's talk about how the matrix of domination relates to one of the core concepts of human computer interaction, affordances. According to the Interaction Design Foundation, affordances are, quote, an object's properties that show how the possible actions users can take, thereby suggesting how they may interact with that object. For instance, a button can look as if it needs to be turned or pushed, end quote. The term affordances was initially developed in the late 1970s by a cognitive psychologist named James Gibson, who stated that the affordances of the environment are what it offers the animal, what it provides or furnishes, either for good or ill, end quote. And the term came to be influential in various fields following design professor William Gaver's much cited article, Technology Affordances. And then it moved into much wider use in HCI, human computer interaction, following the publication of cognitive scientist and interface designer, Donald Norman's The Design of Everyday Things. So for Norman, affordance refers to, quote, the perceived and actual properties of a thing, primarily those fundamental properties that determine just how the thing could possibly be used. Oh, I'm one slide behind. So for example, a chair affords sitting, a doorknob affords turning, a mouse affords moving the cursor on the screen and clicking, and a touch screen affords tapping and swiping. The design of everyday things where Norman talks about this. It's a canonical text for designing. It's full of useful insights, compelling examples, but it almost entirely ignores race, class, gender, disability, and other axes of inequality. Norman very briefly states that capitalism has shaped the design of objects, but he says it in passing and he never relates it to the key concepts of the book. Race and racism appear nowhere he uses the term women only once in a passage where he describes the amphitheater Louis Laird in the Paris Sorbonne, where, quote, the mural on the ceiling shows lots of naked women floating about a man who is valiantly trying to read a book, end quote. Gay, lesbian, trans, gender, none of these terms appear. Disability is barely discussed in a brief section titled Designing for Special People. In that three-page passage, Norman describes the problems designers face in designing for left-handed people and urges readers to, quote, consider the special problems of the aged and infirm, the handicapped, the blind or near blind, the deaf or hard of hearing, 
the short or tall or the foreign, end quote. He thus firmly subscribes to the individual medical model of disability that locates disability in defective bodies and as a problem to be solved, rather than the social relational model that recognizes how society actively disables people who have physical or psychological differences, functional limitations or impairments through unnecessary exclusion, rather than taking action to meet their access needs, let alone the disability justice model created by disabled Black, Indigenous, and people of color as they fight to dismantle able-bodied supremacy as a key axis of power within the matrix of domination. So Norman's book is a compendium of designed objects that are difficult to use, that provide key principles for better design. So he gives examples of typewriter keyboards and multilingual voice message systems, but he almost entirely ignores questions of how race, class, gender, disability, and other aspects of the matrix of domination shape and constrain access to affordances. Design justice asks us to focus sustained attention on these questions, beginning with how does the matrix of domination shape affordance perceptibility and availability? So we might ask whether any given affordance is equally perceptible to all people or whether it systematically privileges some kinds of people over others. Affordance perceptibility, I'd argue, is always shaped by standpoint or our location within the matrix of domination of race, class, gender, disability, and so on. Every affordance is more perceptible to some kinds of users than others. Second, design justice impels us to consider whether a given affordance is equally available to all people. So for example, stairs, which is another example uh, offered by Gaber, afford moving between two levels of a home for most people, but deny that affordance to those whose type of mobility makes stairs difficult or impossible to use. So for those users, stairs might provide a perceptible but unavailable affordance. An audible alert announcing the arrival of an instant message might enhance perception of the affordances of an instant message client for some users, those who are able to hear the alert, those who have the application minimized in the background, or those who are away from the computer while engaged in another task that occupies visual attention. But it offers no perceptual advantages to other users, those who are deaf or hard of hearing, or who have their computers muted. And as human computer interaction turns increasingly to interactions based on machines detecting, parsing, and predicting human intentions, such as facial recognition, emotion classification, voice control, natural language processing, we need to pause and consider how affordances are never equally perceptible to all and never equally available to all. A given affordance is always more perceptible, more available, or both to some kinds of people. Design justice brings this insight to the foreground and calls for our ongoing attention to the way that those differences are shaped by the matrix of domination. We could also talk about design disaffordances, which match perceptual cues with actions that will be blocked or constrained. In a paper about discriminatory design, philosopher of technology D.E. Witkower provides us many examples of disaffordances. So a fence disaffords entry to a plot of land, a lock on a door disaffords entry without a key, a fingerprint scanner on a mobile phone affords access to the phone's content for the owner and disaffords access to others. Witkower also identifies disaffordances with a Y. It's a term he uses for an object that requires some users to misidentify themselves to access its functions. For example, as a non-binary person, I experience a disaffordance with a Y anytime I interact with a system, like air travel ticketing, that forces me to select either male or female to proceed. And while a graduate student, Joy Bulamwini, experienced the disaffordances of facial detection technology, which failed to detect her dark-skinned face until she donned a white mask. That led her to systematically study bias in facial analysis technology technology and to found the Algorithmic Justice League. 
So design justice is asking us to constantly consider the distribution of affordances, disaffordances, and disaffordances with a Y among different kinds of people. So the point of a design justice analysis isn't to impose just a single best design solution, but to recognize that affordances, disaffordances, and disaffordances privilege some people over others and make those decisions more intentional. To think about whose life opportunities are being uh, enhanced or reduced. Now here I wanna to move to the um, second part of the talk because design justice is a community of practice. It's not just a term that I sort of created out of nowhere. There wouldn't be any design justice theory or practice without the design justice network organizers, especially Una Lee, Victoria Barnett, Wes Taylor, Carlos Garcia, Nancy Kalila Mutiti, Danielle Albert, Victor Moore, Ebony Dumas, Denise Shanti, and many, many others. This community is made up of design practitioners who participate in and work with social movements and community-based organizations across the United States and around the world. And it includes designers, developers, technologists, journalists, community organizers, activists, researchers, and many others. And there are other overlapping communities of practice that do this work besides the Design Justice Network, like the Decolonizing Design Group, data feminists like Catherine Ignacio and Lauren Klein, Afrofuturist speculative design like Alondra Nelson's work, pluriversal designers like Arturo Escobar, and so many more. But I'm going to talk more about the Design Justice Network because that's the community that I'm closest to. So the Design Justice Network was born at the Allied Media Conference in the summer of 2015, when a group of 30 designers, uh, artists, technologists, architects, and community organizers took part in a workshop called Generating Shared Principles for Design Justice. The workshop was planned by Una Lee, Jenny Lee, and Melissa Moore, and presented by Una Lee and Wesley Taylor. It was inspired by the AMP Network Principles, the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition, and the pedagogy of Detroit Future Youth. And the goal of the workshop was to move beyond the frame of social impact design or design for good, and to challenge designers to think about how good intentions are not necessarily enough to ensure that design processes and practices become tools for liberation. Instead, we wanted to create principles that might help practitioners avoid the often unwitting reproduction of existing inequalities. So we developed draft principles at that workshop, and then they were refined by the Design Justice Network coordinators over the next year, revised at the AMC in 2017, and then in 2018, released in the following form. Um, so these are the Design Justice Network principles as they, as they are right now. And there are 10 of them. Principle one, we use design to sustain, heal, and empower our communities as well as to seek liberation from exploitative and oppressive systems. Two, we center the voices of those who are directly impacted by the outcomes of the design process. Three, we prioritize design's impact on the community over the intentions of the designer, because we know where good intentions lead, right? Four, we view change as emergent from an accountable, accessible, and collaborative process, rather than as a point at the end of the process. Five, we see the role of the designer as a facilitator rather than an expert. And six, we believe that everyone is an expert based on their own lived experience, and that we all have unique and brilliant contributions to bring to a design process. Principle seven, we share design knowledge and tools with our communities. Eight, we work towards sustainable community-led and controlled outcomes. Nine, we work towards non-exploitative solutions that reconnect us to the earth and to each other. And finally, 10, before seeking new design solutions, we look for what's already working at the community level. 
we honor and uplift traditional indigenous, diasporic and local knowledge and practices. The Design Justice Network has been growing since the release of the principles in 2018. And it's been nurtured by many, many people. So there are now more than 1,200 Design Justice Network principles, signatories, both individual and organizational. There are more than 300 members who commit monthly time or money to support the network's growth. There are local nodes that are self-organizing in cities around the United States and around the world, a zine series. There are regular network gatherings and tracks at the Allied Media Conference, workshops and talks, a steering committee, including uh, Yuna Lee, Wes Taylor, Denise Shante Brown, and myself, and a network coordinator, Victoria Barnett, um, and local, yeah, local nodes um, popping up uh, all over the place, especially after this summer, we released a new zine uh, called How to Organize a Local Node of the Design Justice Network. And local nodes have a lot of autonomy and are self-organizing to think about how design justice principles might show up in practice uh, in the different locations where, where they're taking place. And as I mentioned before, there are many values aligned groups uh, who are doing design justice work or using frameworks that are very similar, like uh, equity centered community design at the Creative Reaction Lab led by Antoinette Carroll, who holds that systems of oppression, inequality and inequity are by design, therefore they can be redesigned. Most recently in the midst of the global pandemic and the surging movement for black lives, there's been an explosion of interest in design justice, including um, among architects and city planners. So the Design as Protest or DAP Collective emerged in 2017 after Trump's elective, and now they've organized two uh, national conference calls for design justice. They've had hundreds of participants. They released design justice demands uh, for uh, architects and for urban planners. And I encourage you to learn, learn more about them um, by looking for design as protest. And there's a flood of excellent recent work that's rethinking computing through black, queer, feminist, anarchist, green, and other strands of liberatory thought and practice with roots both in the academy and in the key social movements of our time. So, um, you know, we could talk about uh, the uh, More Than Code report, the Consentful Tech Framework, uh, the recent Pathways Through the Portal uh, report about artificial intelligence and public interest. We could talk about the Fat Star community that started in 2014, which is uh, started as fairness, accuracy, and transparency in algorithms. Um, there is so much important work happening in this space. Although design justice also invites a critique of the idea of fairness in computing that many such efforts contain. So Anna Lauren Hoffman has told us in a recent paper on the limits of anti-discrimination discourse um, to be careful about the, the framing of fairness and discrimination in computing uh, if our goal is justice, liberation, and ecological survivability. I also mentioned a little bit uh, Ruha Benjamin's work, Race After Technology, but a little bit more about that because it's so fantastic. Um, in Race After Technology, Benjamin develops the term, the new gym code to highlight the ways that algorithmic decision systems based on historical data sets reinforce white supremacy and discrimination, even as their designers position them as fair in the colorblind sense. So racial hierarchies can only be dismantled by actively anti-racist systems design, not by pretending they don't exist and looking for quote, fairness. So Ruha teaches us that we have to challenge the underlying assumption that our ultimate goal in algorithm design is symmetrical treatment. We need to discuss the difference between algorithmic color blindness and algorithmic justice. For example, Sophia Noble in her work, Algorithms of Oppression, focuses our attention on the ways that search algorithms misrepresent marginalized subjects, beginning with her own experience of the circulation of hypersexualized images of black girls and women. 
what Patricia Hill Collins calls controlling images. And Mary Gray and Siddharth Suri in their recent book, Ghost Work, demonstrate how the seemingly smooth user experience of AI powered services actually depends on the work of a huge invisibilized human labor force. And Virginia Eubanks in Automating Inequality unpacks how algorithmic decision support systems that punish poor people were implemented as a, white, as a right wing strategy to limit and roll back hard fought access to social welfare programs that were originally won by organized poor people's movements. I mentioned already uh, Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren Klein's work on data feminism, which I highly encourage you to check out. Um, the Algorithmic Justice League, where I'm uh, honored to be a senior research fellow, was founded by Joy Bulamwini, who I mentioned earlier, uh, as being best known for demonstrating through evocative audits that facial analysis software performs worst on women with darker skin tones. But in her work with Algorithmic Justice League um, and in the growing team there, we're advocating not only for inclusion, but also for greatly increased public oversight. Joy says that, quote, if you have a face, you have a place in the conversation. If you have a voice, you have a choice. So these analyses aren't only happening inside the academy, they're happening throughout the tech sector as well. They're happening through the Tech Won't Build It movement, led by organizations like Mi Gente to push back on the use of uh, tech systems for the detention and deportation system, and No Tech for ICE, the Carceral Tech Resistance Network, the Our Data Bodies Project, and so many others. There's an explosion of new organizations and networks. Data for Black Lives has emerged as a key community, and I'm excited to hear that uh, Yeshi is gonna be talking soon. Uh, Deb Raji, who's talking at the next uh, event, um, is working also with the Algorithmic Justice League, um, and we're doing some work right now on algorithmic harms discovery. Um, there are so many. The AI Now Institute, the Center for Critical Race and Digital Studies, Data and Society, the Data Justice Lab at Cardiff, the Digital Equity Lab in New York City, the Just Data Lab, the People's Guide to AI by Diana Nusera, Mother Cyborg, the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. There's just a, a groundswell of uh, organizations um, working together to push back on the most harmful uh, uses of technology and try to imagine other possibilities. So I began this talk by saying that there's a sea change taking place. Yes, we have a new administration here in the US. And if we push them really hard, uh, we have the possibility of transformation, although it's going to take a lot of work. The questions that design justice asks us to consider are difficult ones but they're deeply necessary questions. And I hope that we'll all continue to ask them of ourselves and of one another in the years and decades to come. Let's build a world where many worlds fit. Thank you. I'll stop it there and open it up for Q&A. Thank you so much for such a fantastic talk. Um, I just want to remind um, people in the audience that you can ask questions in the Q&A section. Um, I'm just going to give people some time to ask questions um, and maybe I can ask a kind of beginning warm up question. Um, and thank you also for plugging some of our future events as well there and mentioning books by so many scholars that we've had um, the good fortune to have be part of our series or will be part of our series. Um, so uh, obviously, I really love this um, definition of design justice. Um, and as you discuss, one of the ways um, at the um, Allied Media Conference that part of it is seeing designers as facilitators. Um, one question I have um, with your work is, to what degree are we all designers? Because I think many of us might find this a very um, like attractive project, maybe very interested in this idea of design justice, but maybe not everyone sees themselves as a designer. So I'm just curious, um, in your perspective to what degree um, you find it useful or not useful for people to understand themselves and the work they're doing as design or being designers. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a really great question. Um, 
I mean, I think both to me personally and in the Design Justice Network, um, we think about the ways that all, all human beings engage in design, design activity, um, imagining a future, planning, taking steps um, to try and make that future manifest. And so the Design Justice Network is definitely a space that's not meant to be exclusively for people who are part of professionalized design fields. And I would say um, that we actively try to push back on that idea that only um, certain types of professionalized um, you know, people can be part of design justice. Uh, it's def definitely not that. Um, I will say that um, because of the way our world is structured, professionalized designers with, you know, occupy a certain positions of power. And so we do think it's important um, for people from different recognized design fields and subfields um, to engage with the ideas of design justice, but not exclusively so. Um, and I think, you know, you'll see if you look back through the history of the network, it was not formed by people who, who only think of themselves as designers. So there were community organizers and just everyday, uh, you know, conference attendees of Allied Media Conference who think of themselves more as maybe, you know, artists or musicians or some many other identities um, rather than design. I also will say um, design justice and recognizing that people have really valuable experience to bring to the table in any design process based on their lived experience. Um, that does not need to mean specialized skills that people who do identify as designers, um, it doesn't mean those skills are not valued or can't be valuable in a design justice process. You know, if you spent lots and lots of time learning how to use, you know, um, AutoCAD software or Illustrator or Photoshop or learning how to code um, or, you know, you have an architecture degree, um, there isn't, there's absolutely nothing in the design justice approach that says, you know, those skills are frowned upon or would not be valued in a design justice process. It's just that there are many um, different types of experiences that are really useful um, in a process that's concerned with more equitable distribution of, uh, of the outcomes um, of a design process, um, as well as the process itself. Um, I'm seeing some Q&A questions come in. Do you, yeah. do you want to ask them? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll read the first one, then maybe Sophie will read the next. So a question from Mitch or Mish. Uh, what types of designers are part of the network? Is it mainly graphic web designers or UX designers? Does it also include people who design workshops or other things that are not necessarily designing technology per se? Yeah, absolutely. We just talked about this a little bit, um, but it's definitely not mainly uh, graphic and web designers or UX designers, although the talk that I just gave, you know, really focused on uh, HCI and user interface design. Um, and the book draws a lot on those fields. That's because those are the spaces that I personally kind of know best. Um, but the network itself um, is much, much uh, wider than that, even to include people who don't identify as designers at all. Um, but there's a balance, I think there, there are many people who do um, graphic design. Um, we actually, we're starting to do member spotlights in the network. And if you go on designjustice.org, um, you can see um, some of the types of events and talks and member spotlights that are happening. And so, for example, one of our recent uh, member spotlights um, what on, was on a, uh, one of our members, Layla, who has a um, company called Tuna Tones, which, uh, so Layla is a luthier who um, makes guitars and takes a design justice approach um, to building guitars and instrument design and has a really interesting talk about what that, uh, what that means to them. Um, so yeah, workshop design would absolutely be, there are many people who are facilitators or workshop designers in the network. Fantastic. Sophie, do you wanna ask the next one? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Zanad. I hope that I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, who's interested in the first steps of community building. So they ask, uh, when you observe that there is not a common objective in a community or that the community is divided, divided rather, um, 
not in a bipartisan sense, but rather in, an, in a diaspora of objectives, and that they're not used to having agency. Do you have any advice on how to be better, uh, a better design ally to those communities? Another um, interesting and difficult question. Yeah, so the word community does a lot of work, does a lot of hiding, <laughs> obfuscation, um, right? Because once you go into any community, either it's made up of people and groups of people and individuals even within any given community um, have different positions of power and also different within that multi-axis field of the matrix of domination. Um, so I think um, a, a good design process is always a conversation and a negotiation um, between different interests, including within a particular community. And um, to me personally, the way that I approach this is, um, well, number one, um, being a good design ally, I guess, implies that you're not a member of the community that's doing the design process. And I think that that doesn't always have to be the case. Um, so in some sense, what's really great is to think about how um, design processes might be led or initiated by um, particular people within a community and then um, seeking support maybe from um, design allies or maybe maybe not at all maybe everything happens there um, and there's no there's no needed role um, um, for a design ally in other cases uh, that that might be requested um, I think part of it is what guides me is the design justice network principles so I would ask those questions of any process no matter how quote unquote you know grassroots or from the community um, it appears to be at first glance and it's also about making those conversations and questions explicit. So you'd say, well, within this particular formation of people, you know, what are the gendered power dynamics? What are the dynamics along lines of race or ethnicity or skin tone or migration status? Or what are the, what are the class, um, you know, and wealth dynamics? What are the disability dynamics? And so thinking about um, all of those things and thinking about how, you know, you want to, ensure as much as possible um, that the participation in the process um, is including people even within a particular community who might often be pushed to the side um, would be my approach to that question. Thank you so much. Um, I might ask the question um, from Sapna who says, based Thanks you for sharing your story and says, based on your principles, can you talk about how it makes storytelling more inclusive? Um, they write, I co-chair a committee at NYU and we are working to make storytelling more inclusive and want to learn more about this topic. And they mention graphic design, video photography as potential options. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I would throw that question, you know, back to you. Uh, I, I have a background in storytelling. I spent many years um, working in film and video production and working with the Indie Media Network back in the early days of the open web. Um, and I think, you know, wow, Indie Media had a lot of problems and challenges that we didn't really overcome, although it was a really great, uh, I think, experiment in open publishing and free software and movement-led, um, you know, community filmmaking and storytelling. Indie Media suffered from dynamics of patriarchy and cisnormativity and um, an emphasis on you know, powerful, more powerful actors in the global north, um, sort of erasure of local uh, independent media activities. Um, so I think this is a really, it's a really hard one. Um, I think one, one way to approach that question for me, um, whenever you hear someone talk about, um, we want to tell someone's story, or we want to quote, provide a voice for the voiceless, um, I think that should always raise some questions and some flags um, because everybody has a voice and people are telling stories already. So the question is, um, if you're not from a particular community, but you have a desire to lift up and support and amplify um, key stories there, um, you know, who's already speaking or sharing or telling that story? Um, and, you know, if you are a skilled uh, storyteller in some ways that you have filmmaking skills, you're a good cinematographer or an editor or whatever the case may be, you have a production company, um, 
what are the mechanisms you can use to help uh, support and amplify and put that skill set um, at the service of um, you know, amplifying existing storytellers already. Thank you for uh, those suggestions. And I have another question from uh, an anonymous attendee who asks, um, they say, I'm really excited about the way that various groups boost their content and manipulate the algorithm on TikTok. And it seems that this, the same might be done on YouTube, a place where many people are, are radicalized in a, in a bad way. Um, uh, and they ask, of the groups that you mentioned, are any people working to with, I guess, algorithms um, related to video content, they mentioned YouTube and TikTok specifically, or any sort of projects like this that you might be able to guide this attendee towards. Yeah, this is interesting. I mean, I think there are there is a history of sort of political projects attempting to um, game algorithms um, to increase visibility, but. Um, also, these are very, you know, powerful platforms that are multinational firms that their primary interest is, um, you know, as Shoshana Zuboff has talked about it, it's surveillance capitalism. So the idea is you need to gather as much attention as possible. You need to package and sell user eyeballs um, to advertisers. And so in a web economy that's structured by the drive to um, profit uh, and attention capture, unfortunately, there's a lot of incentives um, for algorithm for al algorithmic content recommendation to push people um, in some very bad directions around like uh, you know content that is shocking content that is um, that enrages content that generates uh, strong emotions around anger and disgust um, you know performs really well and generates more revenue and so I think while there are important you know you know, it's always a dance between content creators and platform owners in terms of trying to figure out, you know, how things work. But there are structural political economic factors that lead us in bad directions. And, you know, the, the, the thankfully failed white supremacist coup attempt, um, you know, in the US Capitol last week, <laughs> two weeks I can't even, I don't know what time it you know it is anymore but um you know is sort of partially you know evidence of what happens um when you have highly mobilized white supremacists real world networks um backed by a powerful political class also backed by um extremely well-resourced broadcast networks like Fox and then that feeds in the media ecosystem um, into what's happening on a space like YouTube or other social media platforms. And so um, I think that part of what we need to do here um, is push for uh, stronger regulatory oversight. Um, the, the platforms are not going to modify their algorithms in a way that uh, benefit marginalized people um, without being forced to do so. Um, and the mechanisms that we have, you know, include, uh, include regulation, uh, include call, include um, um, anti-monopoly provisions. So there are uh, there is now a significant effort that's gaining you know steam to break up uh, some of the biggest um, tech monopolies. Um, there are a number of mechanisms. I would really recommend here uh, the work of Joan Donovan, um, who uh, is working on disinformation and disinformation networks and um, thinking really carefully about how to um how to disrupt them thank you for that and um, we have a couple of questions that talk about engaging different groups with design justice principles so i'm going to kind of combine them um, anna asks about what additional considerations need to be taken into account when trying to incorporate design justice into initiatives in the global south especially when resources are scarce and many decision makers have more conservative worldviews and um, another question that is kind of along those lines in terms of engaging different groups is an anonymous attendee talks about working with youth climate activists and is also interesting in how to engage um, that community with design justice principles. Absolutely. Um, so I gave, I gave a talk. Um, oh my gosh, it was before the pandemic. I think it was 
the one of the last talks that I gave uh, before the pandemic at, uh, at Rhode Island School of Design. And the topic of that conference, um, it was around the role of design in the Green New Deal. And uh, so my, my talk, it, it is recorded and it's about design justice and the Green New Deal and what that means. Um, and I think, you know, especially now that we have an administration that's come in that, yeah, it's still, uh, it's still an imperial neoliberal uh, administration, but at least there is uh, a possibility of pushing them towards uh, progressive uh, projects and the Green New Deal is certainly going to be part of that. And so the conversation about how we can radically rethink and transform uh, our entire economy and our, our distribution systems and our energy system and um, our housing systems and so on and so forth um, in ways that can help um, help us emerge from the current collapsing climate catastrophe and shift towards um, a world where humans can survive and where the many other non-human species that are rapidly being destroyed and driven to extinction um, through human activity can also survive. That conversation about how we can make that shift and how we can make that shift in a way um, that will more equitably, more equitably distribute uh, resources, uh, jobs, um, access to resources, both um, to marginalized populations within the one third world or the global north uh, and the two thirds world or global south, um, you know, plus marginalized populations within the north, migrant populations and so on. That's a that's a really important and huge conversation. Maybe it's one of it's the defining conversation of our time, um, and design of different kinds, you know, is going to play a role in every one of those transformative processes. So if we're going to have entirely new energy systems, well, um, there's a role uh, for technology designers and developers in that. If we're going to rethink how housing operates and how cities operate um, to minimize carbon footprint and so on and so forth. Architects and urban planners are going to be you know, key to that. So in each one of the areas that we know we need to transform the way that we live and work, um, there, there's a role for, for, for design justice, I think. Great, thank you. Um, I have another question from an anonymous attendee who asks uh, to what extent the Design Justice Network has uh, worked with big tech, quote unquote, and how the movement envisions changing uh, the power way that these uh, corporations work. And I think I would just, if they don't mind, like to uh, sort of ask another question along the same lines, which is that, you know, you discuss these different local chapters and nodes of the Design Justice Network. And I was wondering how the network in general sort of envisions their their relationship to big tech or if there is a sort of um, consensus around the various uh, nodes of the network and how that works. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting question. Um, so the design justice network as an as an entity, you know, hasn't released uh, particular, you know, statements about big tech per se. Um, I think clearly big tech companies don't follow any of the design justice network principles. <laughs> um, so um, right now uh, there's a lot of work to be done. I think I talked about this near the end of the talk. There's a moment of great ferment and organizing happening inside the big tech companies. Um, and that's been unfolding and growing in fits and starts. Um, well, for a while now, but especially over the last few years, I mentioned a few, but you know, we have everything from the um, the Me Too, Me Too movement inside Google, um, you know, the Google Walkout for Real Change with you know thousands of employees around the world um, challenging um, sort of patriarchal structures inside um, inside the the organization. We had um, 
Google employees pushing back, trying to get Google to cancel um, surveillance contracts with uh, the government of China, trying to cancel contracts with the Department of Defense with Project Maven, um, um, pushing back around Project uh, Jedi so that, you know, trying to, the cloud contract for the U.S. Department of Defense. Um, so there's lots of organizing happening there. We just have um, very recently the um, Alphabet Workers, uh, you, you know, union um, has emerged. So there's now a um, union formation inside Alphabet, which is Google's parent uh, company that uh, notably includes not only, um, you know, the developers and full-time employees, but includes contract workers and includes people across the organization. Um, and you have similar um, motion happening inside a number uh, of, of different, you know, big tech companies. Um, definitely there are people inside those companies reading um, work from the Design Justice Network, looking to what we're doing, looking at the principles, um, reading my book, reading the zines that we've produced. Um, and I think there, there are a lot more people trying to reckon with the role that they're playing in um, and, and the products that they're building, the role that that, that plays in um, fortifying rather than undermining oppressive systems. And so I definitely support people who are inside different kinds of institutions, um, trying to push those institutions uh, as far as possible. Um, I think recently we saw with Dr. Tim Gebru, who was leading Google's AI you know, ethics work, um, but was fired um, for calling out, um, well, it's, it's a long story, but basically um, for doing some work that uh, uh, on the one hand demonstrated um, some of the harmful environmental impacts of AI models and some of the ways that AI models aren't actually living up to Google's supposed ethical principles, and also for internally um, advocating for and talking about the ways that diversity and inclusion initiatives there um, were really not moving the needle um, in ways that the company uh, likes to project. Um, so Timnit was, was Dr. Gibber was fired. Um, and I think that that's, that was a horrible decision, you know, coming from Google leadership and it's going to haunt them for a long time. Um, but it also, you know, is one of those moments that points to the ways that um, yes, we want to support and bring in um, people inside these companies that are pushing them as far as possible, but never losing, losing sight of the fact that um, the companies are not going to do the right thing um, out of the goodness of their hearts or even by soul searching. Um, you know, we need strong regulatory oversight and we need strong people, people's movements um, that can push and force and win uh, victories at every level, whether it's, you know, municipal policymaking, like all of the bans on facial recognition technology that are spreading from city to city um, across the United States right now, um, or its other um, you know, tech policy areas. We need organized people um, outside and inside these companies um, to hold them to account and to force them to be better. And in some cases, um, we have to sue them we have to break them up uh, and we do have to build alternatives. And that's some of the real interesting to me and very difficult, but in the long run, fundamental to the vision of design justice. It's not only about defense and critiquing and attacking, that's crucial, but we also have to, have to imagine what does it look like to build consentful technologies? What does it look like um, to build uh, decentralized, uh, you know, infrastructure, you know, for the web, re-decentralization, um, but with accountability mechanisms. What would it look like um, to create social media platforms um, that from the very beginning took into account all of the insights that have come um, from feminist activists and organizers who know what types of affordances we need to put in place um, so, that, so that social media platforms aren't overrun um, by, by bigots and trolls and misogynists. Like we know how to do a lot of this stuff, but we don't control the capital um, at the scale that would let us build the sustainable alternatives. So we have to figure out how to do that. 
I really appreciated how you just talked about the building alternatives and not just defense, but also offense too. And this power in giving ourselves the chance to imagine. And that's something I also really admire about Ruha Benjamin's work as well, right? Allowing us to imagine better futures and that the big tech or the, the powers that be don't currently own the future. We can create new futures. And along those lines, um, an anonymous attendee had a question that said that they loved all the nonfiction brilliance you mentioned. And they asked, do you have any favorite fiction that you feel plays with design justice in inspiring or thought provoking ways? Oh, so much. Yeah, so much. Um, so I'm a huge fan uh, of Octavia Butler. Um, and I think that you know, there's, there's a lot more to say about that, but I think actually when I, what I want to highlight right now um, is this project that's really squarely uh, in that space. This is the Oracle for Transfeminist Futures. Um, and I'm going to share my screen again briefly. Um, let me bring this in. So the Oracle for Transfeminist Futures is a project that I developed together with um, Coding Rights and with uh, Joanna Varon and others um, from that organization. Coding Rights is a uh, Brazil-based um, transnational organization that um, it's sort of like a, a, a feminist tech policy and creative organization. And we created um, this card deck uh, and it's an oracle from the future embedded with transfeminist values to help us create uh, new worlds. And these are some of the, um, you know, some of the, the values that are in the deck. Um, autonomy, accountability, pleasure, open source, horizontality, uh, decoloniality, solidarity, agency, multi-speciesism, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and then we have everyday objects, um, like sandals and backpacks and umbrellas and skateboards and spoons and lipstick and plants. Um, and I won't share all of the deck, but um, basically um, this is a project with a, a sort of guide uh, set of instructions that you can use to deal yourself a hand um, and use the Oracle to create uh, speculative transfeminist technologies from the future and then create blueprints for them. Uh, and people can learn more about that project at transfeministtech.org. Fantastic. Um, Sophie, before you ask the question from Ariana, I just want to um, uh, say that love the Oracle deck. I saw that it's sold out already. Is there a plan to reprint it? And also um, Mitch, uh, said that they appreciated uh, when he did the workshop with the um, deck at the AMC conference and they're wondering if it ships to Canada or if the digital version can be used for activities. Um, yes, it does ship to Canada and there is a um, there is a digital version of the workshop. Um, the first print run did sell out um, faster than we expected and we're planning another uh, another print run. If you go on the on the website um, you can actually uh, sort of fill out a pre-order form, um, which you don't have to pay any money now, but it'll get you on the list to get a notification as soon as the, um, the new decks arrive, um, and so that you can be sure to get one. Fantastic. Sophie, would you like to ask the last question? Sure, yeah. Um, so this is from Ariana or Ariana. Uh, do you know of any urban planning institutions using a design justice approach? Or do you have any advice on encouraging planners to integrate design justice? Um, yes, absolutely. So here, um, I think that I will um, share my screen briefly again. Um, so uh, if, you're in, if you're a planner or an architect, I really recommend that you check out dapcollective.com. This is the Designers Protest Collective and I mentioned them in the talk. But so this is a network of anti-racist designers dedicated to design justice in the built environment. Um, and they've created a set of design justice demands specifically for 
um, you know, planners and architects. Um, and those include, you know, sort of like domain specific stuff like um, the need to end uh, septed tactics, which is the sort of environmental design philosophy that says that, you know, you should, um, you know, try and it's like bro broken windows implemented in the built environment. Um, and so they say we need to end septed tactics, divest and reallocate police funding, um, stop designing prisons and detention facilities, and so on and so forth. So I really recommend uh, DAP Collective um, to anyone who's working in that space. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk today and your generosity in the Q&A session. I also want to thank you so much for making so many of your materials so accessible and all of the work that you do with the Allied Media Project and all of the different resources that you have made available. And I want to thank everyone here today for joining us and I hope you come to our future events. Thank you again so much. Thanks so much for having me. Bye. Bye.